Welcome everyone. My name is Beth Pigush. I am the FSPA Integral Ecology Director. As we get started, unless you are a speaker, if you could mute yourself, that would help our recording and presentation. And um, we are going to be learning about the glory of birds. We will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. But if you would like to ask questions on the bird that our presenters are talking about, feel free to add that question to the chat. Or if you raise your hand, we'll try and notice it so you can ask it, let's say in real time on the specific bird that our guest speakers are talking about. So if there are any other technical questions, feel free to message me in the chat box and I'll try and help you through it. But for now, I'll turn it over to Sister Meg. Wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Um, so so we're, we're going to get started, but um, I just thought I'd tell you because I'm sure you don't know this already, but I'm an avid birder. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I love birds and every spring I am reminded by how much I love birds and um, how that I love all of nature, but you know, nothing quite compares to birds for me. So I'm really excited to be able to be part of this. And um, when Beth and I were talking about different, um, different topics for an eco action lunch and learn, I said, well, you could talk about birds in May because birds are in peak migration in this area in May. And she said, great. And I said, do you know anyone who might be able to help with that? So uh, I have a couple friends here today who I'll be introducing in just a minute. But um, that is how we came, came to uh, decide that this would be a great time to do it. So just so everyone, at least in Iowa and Wisconsin, no, it is peak migration here. I just can't say for sure about Nigeria um, because I don't know enough about birding in Nigeria, although I'd be happy to come and learn more. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and share my screen. All right, so as we get started, I think it's good to start with just a little bit of um, quiet, just a little bit of centering ourselves as we get started um, and just remind ourselves that we are in the presence of the creator, um, that, uh, that we are always in that presence and all of creation is in that presence. So as we start, I've got just a little bit of time where if we could have some quiet, we are going to, uh, we're going to listen to some bird song to get us started. And as we um, and as we say our little prayer, we're going to invite all of creation to join us in praising God. So this is a reading from Daniel. Let the earth bless the Lord, praise and exalt God above all forever. Mountains and hills bless the Lord, praise and exalt God above all forever. Everything growing on earth, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. You springs, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. Seas and rivers, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. You sea monsters and all water creatures, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. All you birds of the air, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. All you beasts, wild and tame, bless the Lord. 
Praise and exalt God above all forever. All you mortals, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt God above all forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, so just a quick introduction of my two very good friends who are both from Fairfield, Iowa. So all those, those of you in Fairfield would, uh, or those of you in Iowa probably know of Fairfield. Um, so the first person that I'd like to introduce you to is Therese Comiskey. She um, is an avid, avid birder, much, much like uh, myself, only much better. Um, and so she, <laughs> she's, been a, she's been a birder for a while. Um, this is just a little bio, but you know, really, she's just a nature lover and um, really dedicated to bringing nature to other people. So um, it's made a lot of sense that she might be interested in this. I'm so glad she said yes. <laughs> so uh, Therese, before we get uh, get too far, could you give, give, give us an idea of like what had really um, made you so into birds? What was, what was that initial experience that really got you hooked? Well, I've been a nature lover my whole life, been a naturalist for about 35 years. I've always loved birds. Um, uh, I had a wonderful mentor in Diane Porter, who you're going to meet in just a second. You know, as I was a naturalist, I'd call her out to do birding programs at the park for me, and I learned a lot from her. But in 2011, I watched a movie called The Big Year, and it's about this competition of how many birds a bir birders see in a year. And I thought, I'm going to try that next year. I wonder how many birds I see. And honestly, it got me so hooked. And I ended up even going down to uh, Texas with my friend, uh, Meg Ursley, now known as Sister Meg, uh, because we just got so obsessed with, uh, with birding. So that's where I started from. Thank you. And then as Therese mentioned, we also have Diane Porter here. Um, she's a naturalist and an educator. And um, I don't know, I just think I pretty much sit in awe of her as she talks about her bird calls and she just knows everything about birds but um I just really enjoy enjoy spending time with Diane and any excuse that I have um Diane how about you so what what got you hooked on birding you know what I think back to when did I first start watching birds or being interested in birds and I, I guess it really was when I was a child I'd never heard of bird watching but um there used to be uh, Brewer's Blackbirds on the front yard of my, my house in California. My father assured me that I could indeed hold one in my hands if I would just sneak up on it and put salt on its tail, then it would not fly away and I could grab it. So I spent many, many hours as a young child trying to sneak up on the blackbirds to put salt with a little salt shaker in my hand, hoping to put the salt on the tail. I, I was really kind of slow, you know, but I did like the birds. And uh, they always just personify the glory of, of creation to me. They, they just, their, their aliveness speaks to the deepest part of my soul. Um, and um, when I, st I didn't start actually, I didn't actually start watching birds per se until I was an adult. But um, a friend took me birding one time. She said, there's this thing called bird watching. And she, she um, handed me her bird book, which she actually then let me keep because she said she had two and she didn't need two different bird books. So she gave me one of them. Ha ha ha, I now have like 105. But anyway, um, I went birding with her and I saw, I, I saw something move in a bush. She said, look at it with your binoculars. And I, I, I said, I'm not sure I see anything there, but I do see a wiggle. And she said, well, look, look, look. So I put my binoculars up to my eyes and I saw this beautiful big orange and black and white bird with, a, with red eyes. And it looked about the size of a chicken. And I said, I took the binoculars away and I said, where's the bird? And I looked through the binoculars, there's this big thing. I didn't even know how to use binoculars. I couldn't believe how big it looked. Well, it turned out it was a towhee, much like the, the Eastern towhee that we have now. And I think in that one second, I was just, you know, completely lost and hopelessly a birder and I've never recovered. In fact, I just get worse all the time. <laughs> That's excellent. It's very similar to my experience. I know that 
I know that I just couldn't believe how many birds were around me that I never noticed before. And then it just got me hooked wanting to find them all. So wonderful, wonderful. So uh, we have a very interesting plan on how to do this. We're going to um, show a series of photos. I have birds that are migrating through Iowa and Wisconsin right now or white or migrating back to Iowa and Wisconsin right now um, that are, are in here first. And um, the, the plan was that I wasn't supposed to tell Diane and Therese what order they were in so that they, they would be surprised. <laughs> so um, we do have, just in case we get through all of those, we do have some uh, more year round birds in Iowa and Wisconsin that we'll showcase um, if we have time. All right, all right. So you two ready? I guess so. Ready, Ooh. Diane? I'm ready. Okay. All right, let's go. Our first bird. La, la, la. Uh, Mr. Sleek. Yeah. The first time I ever saw a cedar waxwing, I didn't know what it was, but there was, we lived in the mountains and there was a chimney uh, from the, from the uh, fireplace in our house. And we heard something rattling in there and looked inside and reached up and I pulled out a bird that had somehow come down the chimney. And I, I was just starting in bird watching and I didn't know what it was, but I saw that the end of its tail was bright yellow. And I looked it up in my Peterson's Field Guide, which was mostly black and white, that old version that was many years ago. And I looked through every picture, but I found nothing with a yellow tail because he only had a black and white illustration of that bird. So it took me some time before I realized that that was the cedar waxwing. But I don't know any other bird that has just that yellow stripe, right at, uh, not a stripe, a band right at the end of the tail. And in the picture, you can also see a tiny bit of red on the tip of the wing. That's where he gets his name Waxwing, as if the tips of his wings have been have been dipped in hot wax. When I worked with kids, I used to tell the kids that uh, when this bird was growing up, his mother always told him to look his best, because this is a sleek looking bird. And the mother always told him to stand up straight, but mom forgot to tell him about not eating with their mouth full. Because this <laughs> bird, which is a really a fruit lover, is a pig when it comes to eating fruit. And you're lucky during migration when they'll flock into your yard and land on your, one of your fruit trees and just start consuming fruit in great number. And as you can see on the, one of the pictures that they'll toss those berries back and swallow them. And even to the point they love them even when they're getting fermented. So it's not unheard of for them to get a little intoxicated. And it's not unheard of for them to eat so much fruit <laughs> that they have to wait a while before they can fly. So it's a really cool bird. All right. Next bird. Ah, uh, the rose-breasted grosbeak. It looks like he's got a strawberry uh, crab, is that you say cravat? You know, uh, that vest thing on his, on his uh, breast. And his, the mate is not flashy looking at all like this, but when this bird first shows up in town, usually in May, I start getting phone calls, people are calling up and saying, you won't believe what I've just seen. And there's five of them on my feeder. As these birds talk about pigs, these birds really love sunflower seeds. And you see that huge beak? He's called gross beak. When I used to talk to school kids, I would say, you know, gross, what does gross mean? And they didn't know it meant big, but it just means he has a big beak. And it is a ginormous beak designed for cracking seeds. I just saw one of these the other day where his uh, his uh, little cravat there was actually yellow instead Ooh. of red. So sometimes I know that a lot of birds can't produce the yellow and red pigment. It comes from the fruit, the food they eat. So yeah. it's possible his pig, he's not getting enough red pigments for his, his little uh, vest thing there, whatever you want to call it, his bandana. So yeah, beautiful bird. Sounds a little bit like a robin who's taken opera lessons. Wouldn't you agree with that, Diane? I would, because the robin's going, cheer up, truly, cheer up, cheer up. This one goes, cheer up, oh, cheer up, hey. Like, he's just so full of himself, and I, I just love, and he goes on and on and on, whereas the robin will pause, but this guy never, never takes a breath, and it is breathtaking to listen to him. <laughs> and now's the time to listen. Be out there and listen for this long, long, loud, dramatic song, and it sounds a little bit like a robin that's just too full of himself, and that's the rose-breasted ghost Whoops! <laughs> Oops, sorry, sorry, got a little click happy there. This is the surprise one. Oh, well, 
this is a house rent. I can tell because it's written right on top there, Meg. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> That's very handy. This one looks like he's like he's like uh, you know a little like he's been drinking too many fermented berries. But I think he was just blinking at the time. This this bird is a loudmouth. He he chatters and sings all the time with a very loud, a little tiny bird with this great big loud sound that um, when he comes back in the spring, you, you definitely know he's back. They're also one of those few birds that really doesn't mind if they're, they're a cavity nester, so they're gonna nest inside a birdhouse or a hole in a tree, um, but he'll kind of utilize whatever's there. Uh, might be the gloves you left hanging on the line or a tin can you left out, they'll nest in just about anything. And they don't mind if their uh, nest swings a little bit. Some birds don't like that, but I'll, I'll put a gourd birdhouse out that'll swing in the tree and they'll utilize that as well. So they're pretty, pretty, they like being around people it seems, so they're, they're pretty easy to attract to your yard. I actually heard one time about a family of house wrens that build a nest on the, on the bumper of, I don't know if that's what you call it, but it was the front of a train. It was in a train yard where it just moved back and forth about a half a mile. And it, it raised its young that way while the train was going back and forth, shuffling cars back and forth in the train yard. They're very adaptable. Awesome. Ooh la la. Oh la la, Baltimore Oriole, oh. <laughs> This guy really wakes you up with his song. It's a really piercing, piercing whistle. And um, this bird absolutely loves to eat jelly. He's a fruit eater, but he'll settle for any kind of, people used to say, oh, it has to be Welch's grape jelly. And I religiously bought Welch's grape jelly for years to put in a little container outside and put in a little feeder just for the Baltimore Orioles. But then I found out one time when I was out of grape jelly that they would eat any kind of jam or jelly, including, you know, preserves left over from last Christmas, orange marmalade, they'd, they'd eat it all. Um, and they're, um, they're not the only ones, but they're the main customers at that, at the, at that feeder. But if you put out feeders for um, Baltimore Oreos, you're going to get a lot of other birds too, like catbirds and woodpeckers and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, this is the male. The female is yellow and much lighter in color. Uh, you, you'll hear them singing like they're singing right next door to you, but you usually have to look up. It oftentimes they're on the top of the trees. I noticed one the other day when I was up birding, starting to collect long strands of grass and, and to start building their, their hanging, the little hanging pendulum nest that they make. Um, so he's a great thing to have in your yard. They also do something called gaping. When they have a nice ripe fruit, They'll put their beak in, they'll stick their beak in, and then they will open up their mouth. They'll put their mouth open, form a little groove in that fruit, and as the juices run into that groove, then they lick it up with their, they'll lap it up with their tongue. Ah, that's so, awesome. Great, ad, great adaptations. Ah, the other, the other jelly eater. Oh, the catbird is very, very, um, Virtuos, virtuos, what's the, what's the adjective for virtuoso? Virtuositic. He <laughs> sings constantly and um, he's imitating other bird sounds, but he's also making up his own sounds. And you can, we, we have in the Midwest three birds that are all related that are, that are called mimic thrushes. And um, this week, the mockingbird is one who always says everything about five or six times, like Beedly, 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 Then you have the brown thrasher that says everything twice. And then you have the gray catbird that's just so full of, of his, what he wants to express. That he can only get it out once. And sometimes he tries to say two things at once. <laughs> and they put it a long time, a long time. So they even say they timed it one time. They had a catbird who sang continually for 10 minutes. So they're a big singer. Um, and they're a bird of shrubby areas. You know, you tend to find them low in the shrub and hiding among there, it's really cool. I got one more thing I wanna say about that guy. And that is that even though it seems like a skulker and something that stays a little back in the shrubs a lot, 
they they're very they seem to be very intelligent they seem to size up the situation better than some birds that are more mechanical in their responses to things and i noticed that when i was feeding bluebirds and getting bluebirds to come up close to me that the catbirds were hanging around one in particular that i knew was a mama just kept watching and watching from a distance and then the day came when the bluebirds weren't there that that she swooped in, landed right on my lap to get some mealworms. And of course the bluebirds immediately ran her off. They were full, but they didn't want to share with the, with the catbird. But I was surprised that the catbird would be so willing to approach a human being. But uh, I've noticed that they're, they are kind of tame like that. Well, another thing about catbirds, they get their name from the fact that in among this long uh, song they sing, every now and then they stop and they meow. Pretty much like a cat, not a straw meow, but meow. They'll get something like a cat. Right yep. When you hear a cat in the in the woods, you can hope it's a cat bird and not and not a cat. If you ever do see the nest, and it's usually quite low in the bushes, and the eggs are a beautiful, beautiful turquoise color. Yep. I'm done now on cat bird. <laughs> Oh, it's like you bird. knew what I was, which order I was going to put. All it. right, okay. So the cat bird is the one that says everything twice. So he goes gobbledy gobbledy go 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 go. It'll just go on and on and on, just making it up as he goes along. Somebody actually made a study of it and found that he had at least two thousand different unique songs, but he did repeat them eventually. But just this enormous repertoire. No other bird in North America sings as many different individual songs as the brown thrasher. And he does another thing that I haven't seen other birds do, and that's that he likes to feed in the ground. And I've, I've seen them put their bill in the ground and then just swoop it back and forth sideways like this, just throwing. I, I was blaming my little dog for, for digging up my plants. And then I saw the brown thrasher where I'd been planting and all that nice soft dirt. And he was just kicking the, the I mean, billing the so the dirt from side to side looking for grubs in the dirt. It's one of the characteristic things about this bird is that what he does with his bill. Very cool. Um, they're omnivorous. They eat both um, uh, buds and seeds and um, little invertebrates, really varied diet. And they're real aggressive at their at their nest. You don't want to mess with their nest. They'll They'll let you know and they've been known to attack dogs and an occasional person who try to mess with their nest. That would be fun. <laughs> Not to mess with their nest. <laughs> we have a couple of questions, if, if I may. Okay. Um, first one <laughs> is what bird identification software is most popular without a smartphone? I think Diane can probably answer that one best. Oh, uh, no, actually, um, I mean, on the computer, on a computer, there's a wonderful site by um, the, by Cornell Lab of Ornithology called All About Birds, mm -hmm. and you can look up, and it's free, and you can look up any bird and see identification points. You can play that song, but um, you know, it's not something you would carry around on your phone. But if you want something to identify in the field and you don't have a phone, then you need to use this marvel of technology called a book, <laughs> a field guide. And a field guide is really, in my opinion, better than any yeah. app for finding a bird because you can compare many things at once. You can thumb through the pages, go back where you were, and, uh, and you see a, a, a perfect artist. Uh, rendition of each bird that um, is not dependent on the vagaries of light or, or pose or and so on. So I, I really like the Peterson Field Guide, the Sibley Field Guide, the yeah. Audubon Society, I mean the uh, National National Geographic Field Guide. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of really good basic field guides. Mm -hmm. Every Everyone who likes birds should at least own one. Okay. I've given up on asking people to carry them with them in the field because everyone's so addicted to these little phones, but really the book is the best. What do you yeah. think, Therese? I have a Sibley guide. Um, so that's that's my favorite guide is a Sibley. But I also do have it on my phone as well. I'm yeah, going to keep on that. <laughs> Sorry. That's really helpful information. And in the chat box, I put the link for the 
Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Is Good. that possibly the one you were talking about, Diane? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's okay. see if I look at chat if I'll see it there. Yeah, um, yeah and that's I'd that's, say that's, that's what that I use the like. most. Right. Yeah. It. It's just it's just got really good information, same kind of information that you find in field guides, but lots yeah. of pictures that you can compare things to, usually even video and sounds in there. Yeah, it's 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 indispensable. Okay. So if you did have a smartphone, maybe this question's for you, Therese and Sister Meg, what smartphone app might you use for, for birding? My smartphone app that I use, I have iBird Ultimate. And then for identifying that bird in the field, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I have a picture of it. I have Merlin Bird ID. Uh, so those are my two that I have on my phone. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, Ultimate and Merlin Bird ID. Yeah, so Merlin bird ID is really great. If you're able to get a picture of it, um, then you can actually put the picture in and it'll look it up and try to do its best to compare it and find, find a match. Uh, the only other thing that I use too to keep track of the birds that I see is eBird. Um, eBird is just, it's not a field guide. Like iBird Ultimate is my go-to field guide uh, app as well. But um, eBird lets you uh, keep track of all the birds you see and kind of keeps that list going and even will let you see over time the different birds that you've seen and, and keep track. And if you're a data head like I am, then you always wanna go back and, and see what you've seen and what's new and what's new to your life list, that good stuff. So, so eBird, iBird Ultimate and Merlin. Great, thank you. We'll come back to more questions. I'll let you go through a few more birds. Great. All right, you ready for the next one, you two? Yes, please. Wonderful. Oh. I love thrushes. Love thrushes. Go ahead, Diane. <laughs> well, they have such nice, they're such beautiful colors. Uh, it's funny, this particular bird looks to me like a bird sitting on a bird's belly. You know, the, the, the brown part looks like a bird all by itself. You can read it that way, or it's got this big belly, because they are a round bird with these beautiful mm. uh, stripes and spots on their throat. The hermit thrush is the one that has reddish on the tail. There are two other similar looking thrushes, the Swainson thrush and the great cheek thrush, but they, they don't have that distinctive tail redder than the rest of the bird. And this bird has one of the most beautiful songs of any bird in the world. And unfortunately in the Midwest, we don't get to hear it too much, at least in Iowa, we don't. I don't know, maybe you're lucky enough to in Wisconsin, but I have heard this bird singing in, in uh, pine forests and it's very ethereal because each repetition is on a different pitch. So it's like it's constantly modulating and it's a, and it, it just, it, it sort of puts me into a reverie. It's a marvelous bird. Uh, here in uh, Fairfield, Iowa, the hermit thrush is the first of the thrushes that come through in spring. I haven't seen him this year. I, I, I jumped right through to Swainson's thrush. Um, so I don't know if their numbers are down a little bit because that really, really cold weather we had, whatever. But they're just a lovely little bird to see along the trails in the woods. So um, I've never seen one in my yard. I think you need to get out into the uh, trail in a wood somewhere to be a chance to see some of the thrushes. That's in my backyard. Oops. I thought you were done. Break, break, break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the bluebird is also a thrush and it doesn't resemble in coloration the, um, the hermit thrush that we were just looking at, but you'll notice that the, the general shape is the same, the bill is the same because they both eat insects a lot, but they're not fly-catching birds. So they, they pick insects out of bark and out of, off of branches and off of leaves and so on. Uh, and they're, but they also eat some fruit. So they're, they're kind of omnivorous and they have this sort of generalized bill. They are very loyal parents, the male on the right, the female on the left, um, will just work together. There's the teamwork, they're just a model of marriage when you see those two taking care of their young. It, it really, it moves me to tears to watch the parent bluebirds take care of their babies, which by the way, show their relationship to the thrushes because the baby bluebird has brown speckles on its breast, just like that hermit thrush that we just saw and like all thrushes do. Now I know, uh, 
Diane, you have a special affection for bluebirds because you have them in your yard almost every year. And like you said earlier, you actually entice them to come closer with some mealworms. And I've had a chance to uh, be sitting next to Diane when I've had a bluebird come within arm's reach. And it's quite, um, well, it's a real wow moment. It's really it cool. does, does something to your heart to have one of those beautiful things come up and trust you enough to land on you. It's quite wonderful. Sorry about that. All right, go on to the next. <laughs> go, go first, Therese. Oh, indigo buntings. Um, years ago, I was on a trail in the park and a, a lady named Phyllis Thompson came walking by and her, her head perked up and she said, oh, there's an indigo bunting. I went, where, where? Where was the indigo bunting? And she taught me how the indigo, when he calls, it sounds like he's saying, uh, fire, fire, where, where, here, here, hurry, hurry, and, they, and it trails off. And ever since then, I've been a fan of this incredibly beautiful bird. And amazingly, he's not blue unless the sun is shining on. So he doesn't have any blue pigment. It's a reflection. It's a, of the sunlight through his feathers which is pretty, pretty, cool. pretty miraculous. Yeah. And the, the female isn't really blue at all. You might see a bit of blue someplace on a wing, but mostly she's, she looks kind of like a sparrow, just a really drab little bird. Uh, but again, they're, they're very, uh, a very loyal couple. And, and when you see one in the sunlight, it is heart stoppingly blue. The, it's like, it's like the, the color that you see when you have a prism hanging in the window and you see those beautiful colors on a white wall. It's that intensity and purity, which this photo doesn't quite, quite capture, but um, it's so blue and then the head is almost purple. So it's just a, it's just a stunning sight. Yes. Oh. We're doing blue birds, aren't we? I don't know. I didn't mean to. I guess sometimes you do patterns without meaning to. Yeah, I guess you do. <laughs> the tree swallow is a, it's one of our few cavity nesting birds. Um, it'll often nest in a, in a bird house, a bluebird's house or purple martin's house. People who have purple martins go to a lot of trouble to keep the tree swallows from taking over the purple martin gourds or housing. Um, when they make a nest, they always like to put a feather. They'll gather a feather to put in the nest or several white feathers. And some people have, uh, have had fun dropping white feathers out of their windows and having the, the tree swallows swoop by and pluck them out of the air to put in their nest. That's something I live to experience. They seem to be one of the first swallows to return in the spring and the last to leave in the fall. They're rather large. Uh, compared to some of our other swallows. And I know swallows, because they're moving so fast, you can't always identify them, but they have a white, white belly. And so if you can get them to turn and see that white belly, you know you're looking at a, a tree swallow out there. And it's quite a sharp line of demarcation between the white underparts and the blue upper parts. Mm -hmm. By the way, this also is reflected or refracted light. And indeed, no bird has blue pigment in its feathers. Blue is always a reflected color, but the light goes through the, into the feather, hits a, um, a special layer of black pigment at the, at the base of the, of, the, of the fiber of the feather and, is refl and because of uh, crystalline structures that have liquid in them inside of the feathers, it causes it to reflect the black, the blue back out. I don't know why there's no blue pigment, but there isn't. You can have black pigment, red pigment, yellow pigment, but no blue pigment. It's too bad these are so drab, these hummingbirds. Uh, <laughs> I was just looking at one out my window just a second ago. So. Oh, cool. The ruby-throated hummingbird, I think the female is just as beautiful as the male, actually. There's something you can notice here. I mean, this is the, this is the bird that really says full richness of spring to me. It's when the, when the hummingbirds are, are abundant, you know, it's really, spring has really arrived. Um, the feathers are iridescent on the back. 
The bird is very, very tiny, weighs, I think, a tenth of an ounce. Yeah, less than um, a nickel, less than a nickel. Yes, right. And it flies across, when it's returning to North America from, it, from where it winters in Central America, it flies nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico, a flight of over 500 miles. It takes off in the late afternoon. It flies through the afternoon. As it gets dark, it's out of sight of land. It keeps flying all night long, guided, we think, by the stars. Who knows what else? And in the on the next day, in the late morning, it may make landfall along the coast of, of uh, Louisiana or Mississippi. You know, it's a but it's a long, long flight, and it's amazing that such a tiny bird can do this. But before they undertake the journey, they they increase their weight by fifty percent. So they're really fat so's when they start flying, and during that long flight, they burn up all their fat. And then they actually start burning their muscle by the time they make landfall. So I just feel like anything that we can do to make sure that when they land, they have some place to forage and rest and not have it all built up uh, and sprayed with herbicides that you know <laughs> make it so that they can't get the insects that they need as well as the nectar is not what we want to have happen. We really want to keep these beautiful gems in the world. They have, I love the adaptations of this bird. Um, his, when I was, uh, when I first started out as a naturalist, uh, I was told that, you know, they, they suck up nectar from a flower through their beak like a straw. And it's not like that at all. Um, their tongue, which can extend about two times the length of its bill, um, its tongue has, um, is actually um, forked. And so when it puts its, um, beak into a flower, it sticks out its tongue, the tongue is forked, and on that tongue, cover, lining the tongue, are these little tiny hair-like projections, and they'll, they will actually open up, the little hair-like projections open up, and then when they bring their tongue in, uh, when they bring the tongue in again, those projections close, and they close over that nectar and bring it back into the mouth, so that action of bringing it in, they, they, they can do that with their tongue 20 times a second, Wow. To bring in that to bring in that nectar, which is just incredible. Also, to extend their tongue out that far, they have, and like woodpeckers, they have this, uh, I think it's called a hyoid process. It's it's muscle and, and cartilage and bone. And they wrap that part of the that part of the, around their head, and then they can extend that tongue way out. And then when they pull the tongue in, it goes back around. Um, their skull again. So they have this. So is it on the inside or the outside of the skull? Uh, under the skin. Under the skin. On the out, outside of the skull, but oh. under the skin. Yeah. Um, so they have this incredible process to extend that tongue, similar to woodpeckers, and then that incredible way to scoop up nectar. So these tiny things have incredible adaptations. This kind of blows my mind. One so, last little thing about it. When you see one, um, it's really easy in this early spring to tell the males because they have this incredible red gorget unless the sun's not on it, in which case it looks black. But if you only see the tail, the male has two little sharp points of his little fork tail and they're black, but the female has a broader tail with white and the outer tail feathers, the outer corners. So you can always tell the male from the female. Now in late summer, all bets are off when you have babies of the year, but in spring, it's very easy to tell them apart. Uh, Therese and Diane, could you talk a little bit about the sugar water and just kind of a, a solid routine to support them? Do we need to change it often? What yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you expand a little bit on that? Well, as far as, 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 far as um, sugar water, if you have sugar water, you need to make sure that's changed a lot and also that you keep the container clean. I actually just have a uh, uh, columbine out my window right now looking outside the columbine and that is a and that is a nectar producing flower that the um, hummingbirds love do you have nectar diane or do you just have diane ha literally has an incredible variety of flowers in her yard and i know some of them are loved by um hummingbirds well the the columbine is the best example because the columbine opens within i find that within two days 
of the Columbine opening, the ruby throated hummingbirds arrive and they do feed from it. Um, I try to have flowers growing through the whole summer that hummingbirds can use because the columbines, after all, they're gone after a while. I also supplement with uh, a feeder and the, the recipe is, is um, one part of sugar to four parts of water. So you, if you want to bring, I don't usually want a whole quart, so I usually heat up two cups of water, bring it to a boil, and then I add in half a cup of sugar. So it's one part to four. Um, and stir it and that heating it up just makes it easier to dissolve and if there's something you know something growing in the water then it also gets uh, purified by that oh, let it cool and then put it in your in your uh, hummingbird feeder and I change mine at least every other day because you don't want to let it get cloudy and have little bits of mold in there because that can make the hummingbirds ill and to me, that's just the, the, the sugar water is just the supplement because the real solution to the needs of the hummingbirds is lots and lots of flowers and not like one little posy. You want to have big groups, have a bunch of columbines or like the, the, the flowers on the in the left picture. That's a, that's a kind of salvia. Um, I like that one because it kind of looks like little hummingbirds flying out from the from the stem, little miniature hummingbirds. <laughs> Isn't that kind of neat? And that they really love that. Uh, they they love that. Oh, by the way, my husband is is muttering to me from the other room something very important. When you <laughs> feed your hummingbirds, do not think that you're helping them by substituting honey. Honey is very bad for hummingbirds. It makes a fungus grow on their tongue, which can kill them. So you want to use regular old sugar from the grocery store. You know, it's you don't want it to be. Some people have even tried to use, you know, organic honey or something like that, but it has too much iron in them. What's, what that, that sucrose that's in the regular old white sugar is very close to what they get from the flowers. It's not going to turn them into diabetics. It's good for them. It's not the only thing they eat. They also go for the, for the insects that are also around the flowers. Um, to follow up on that, where could someone put a hummingbird feeder? Should it be in a tree? Should it be you can hang it from a, You can hang it from a tree. If you have raccoons, they'll take it down and eat it at night. Um, you, it, it's good to hang it near flowers because the flowers will attract them and then the hummingbirds will find the, the hummingbird feeder. Some people use those shepherd hook things, you know, that you can hang one from. Um, I find that other animals are always a problem. And so I, I hang it under my eaves. Maybe Therese has another solution. I just had to find a place that nothing else could climb up on. I just, I usually just put it out among the flowers and I don't often have uh, um, honey, hummingbird feeders. I stick mostly just there with the flowers. I think the only other thing is you don't need to put red food coloring in it. Very good, uh, yeah. Because the hummingbird feeder has got red on it and they don't care, they don't know that that's water, colored water in there. It's a complete waste and the, and the dye isn't so good for them. So just plain sugar water and much better to do it with flowers. Thank you. All right, so we, this is perfect because we're kind of heading into a different, somewhat of a section now. Ooh. <laughs> Maids, maids, put on your tea kettle, 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 kettle. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely the, done. Nicely done. The uh, song sparrow starts with two introductory notes. Maids, maids, but it's not always exactly like that. And then it ends with that little trill. Put on your tea kettle, kettle, kettle. But you'll find that the song sparrow will sing the same song. I've recorded it and listened to this. It'll sing the same song maybe 10, 15 times. There'll be a little pause and then it'll sing a different version. And if you listen carefully, it's not all exactly the same thing, but it sort of still sounds like the same person talking. I've often thought that, you know, people think that birds just say one thing and that if somebody came from Mars who'd been reading a field book, a field guide on, on what is what are human beings like, they might, uh, one might say, oh, there's a human being. And the other one say, no, I didn't hear him say, hey, how are you? And that's what it says in the book that they should be saying. Isn't that what human beings say? They say, hi, how are you? This one's saying, 
when in the course of human events, you know, what the heck? So, um, so they all do, they do sing different things and the Songsbury has different songs, but it's always the same thing repeated menopause and then the same things repeated. And each sparrow, each song sparrow will have six to 10 songs. And, um, and then it's thought that the females choose which males they will accept as their consort on the basis of who has the best, who's the best singer. I love sparrows because a lot of people just look at them as little brown jobs just a little brown jet, just sparrow. But they're so, they're such subtle beauty and they're really awesome. If you see a bird out along, you know, road when you're driving, he's on the fence post and he's very stripy, eight times out of 10, it's going to be a song sparrow. And the thing is, what's really cool, they find them across the United States, but they look different in different parts of the United States. So this is traditional, a traditional look in the Midwest. If you go down into the Southwest of the United States, it's a much lighter colored bird. If you go up to the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, it's a much darker striped bird. If and you go bigger. up to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, it's even darker striped bird. Plus, it's probably twice the weight of the bird in North in the Pacific Northwest. So they really vary in striping and coloring. Um, but it is one of those, you see a bird in the countryside up on a post, throwing its head back, singing. You can kind of be kind of smart and go, but it's a song sparrow. It's a pretty... Pretty could be, yep. And people will think you know that way too. It's good. <laughs> so um, the white-throated sparrow should really be called the golden spectacled sparrow, in my opinion. Um, the the that bright yellow spot in front of the eye is often even much even more vivid than what you see here. And when the bird looks at you head on, it's, it's, it's quite overwhelming, these two bright, bright yellow headlights. Um, this is a bird that we see in, in Iowa. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't nest here, but we see it in the winter and on migration. I don't know in Wisconsin if, it's, if it might nest up there. Do you know, Meg? Well, I know that they're just coming back to this, this area, the Northwoods. Um, probably over the last week or so. So um, I can't say for sure. I just know that there's not a lot of ground for them to be eating off of in the winter. <laughs> this bird also um, has like you you see on the head the yellow, the white, and the black, but it also has a a tan fate, a tan uh, one too, where there's no there's no white. It's actually tan instead in the forehead. So you'll see them. They're not as and uh, the the white throat is not as, as evident on those as well. So can kind I of two different forms. Can I tell a little story about that? Yes. To me, this is a very awesome thing. They're about 50-50. About half of the, of the white-throated sparrows are strikingly black and white striped on the head. And the other half are strikingly tan and black striped on the head. Now, some people think that the male is the, is the, is the black and white one and the female is the tan one. It's not true. Half the males are the black and white and the other half of the males are the tan, the tan and white. Half the females are black and white, half the females are tan and white. When they get married, a white and black tan, uh, one always marries a brown and white, tan, um, I mean a, a tan and white striped one. They're almost always mixed matings and the chicks in that nest can be all of one, all of the other, or a mixture of the two, but it doesn't go with the gender. However, gender does play a part because the ones with the bright black and white are more, <laughs> nice to read, <laughs> the black and white ones are more dominant than the gray and white ones. And so some people have speculated that they like to have uh, that, that they have a more successful nesting if they have one of each type because one of them will be better at defending the nest and the other one will be better at feeding the babies. And the tan and white ones are better at feeding the babies, whether it's the male or the female. I, I just think it's kind of neat because there's no other bird in North Amer America and maybe no other bird in the world 
that has this kind of, it's called assortative mating, where you have two different forms of the, ma of the male and two different forms of the female. It's, it's just unusual. Cool. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left. Oh no. So I'm gonna, we'll just do one more and then we'll open it up for questions. Then we have a closing prayer and little information about the next one. And then we'll, we'll stay, if you two are willing to, we can stay a little later for more questions if people have. You want to go, Therese? You can go. I oh, a chipping sparrow. It's just got to be the most beautiful sparrow in the world with that, that wonderful rusty head and that very dramatic line through the eye really easily recognizable in the spring or summer but in the winter it's all that all that pattern is just it just goes away and it just looks kind of like a house sparrow just really drab but but it is a spectacular and a tiny little sparrow so pretty i think it's my favorite one and you're and you're going to see it in your yard because this is a sparrow of your backyard what does it sound like therese it, well, it's a trill, and you don't want me to trill. I have no trilling ability, but it's a long trill. If you hear a trill in your yard, uh, it is a shipping sparrow. And the one thing about them is they make quite a flimsy nest, but it's very pretty. It's made of really fine rootlets and hair. And I find them a lot of all the nests that people used to bring into the nature center and show me, look at this nest. I'd say 80% of them were uh, shipping sparrows nests. Not very big, probably about this big around and really fine hair and very flimsy. That was the whole nest. You could probably see the eggs um, through the nest. They're flimsy, but quite beautifully made, or artistically made. So that's our, our chipping sparrow. And if, if you got a yard, you're gonna have a minute somewhere. Let's do one more bird, one more bird. One more bird. One more bird. One more bird. There was a request for a nut hatch. Oh, but or... this is so beautiful, the blue gray okay. nut catcher. <laughs> Therese found this bird, the one that's the, the nest on the right. Look at that little nest made out of spider webs and decorated with lichen. This was just sitting on a branch that had a branch right over it as a little roof in a tree. And um, thank you, Therese, for finding that bird and showing it to me. It's the most, I think this is my favorite bird. <laughs> okay, I'm just doing this one and then we're going to stop. <laughs> Well, I like this picture because this is a, in the sparrow family. This is Diane's bird that sent her on her love of uh, birds. It's the Eastern Tohi, Tohi. But he's really cool because it's a really large sparrow that isn't your traditional kind of brownish camouflage coloring. And of course, his song is um, Drink Your Tea, Drink and Your Tea. And you've heard it. Everyone has heard this song. Yes. And especially if you have my phone, because it's my cell phone ring. This rings. <laughs> So it does go drink your tea, but sometimes all you hear is your tea. <laughs> um, what's cool is he has, he has the traditional uh, way of, hunt, of finding food as sparrows do. Sparrows, one of their uh, characteristics is they jump forward with both feet and scrape backwards. So they jump forward and scrape backwards um, and unearthing insects and other things to nibble on. And he can, uh, he can, he can stir up quite a bit of, uh, of uh, leaves and stuff as he's working, uh, looking for stuff to eat. We'll have to do the regular nut hatch and the red and the red breasted nut hatch another time. We'll That's come so back. Good. We come back. We can <laughs> come back. We can do this every day. Yeah. We didn't even get halfway through the the slide desk, desk deck of the pictures that we had. So there, there's been a request to have you again. So we'll have to figure out something Excellent. to do a follow up. Um, I don't know. I think we've said everything we know, don't you? Well, I have one no. more question for you. Um, <laughs> can you just talk briefly about the current health and the number and status of birds in Wisconsin and Iowa? Um, just, you know, where are we at right now? It's Migratory Bird Month, but how is it, how is it looking? And you talked about, you know, agricultural inputs is affecting some of the birds. What, what's going on these days? Do you know? Well, that's a really uh, long uh, a question with a, a lot of answers. There's a lot of long answers in there. You, I would almost recommend you get on like All About Birds or Audubon and look at some of the information they have. Um, anything you can do as a landowner or uh, to, to increase 
and enhance habitat is one of the best things you can do for wildlife. You know, so often we look at, you know, those people are doing that, those people are doing that, shame on them. You're like, that may be true, but what are we doing as individuals within our own backyards? Do you have your feeders up? Are you planting native, native flowers and native trees? Which is incredible. I mean, you think of a you think of something like a chickadee, and that chickadee has to make thousands of trips with with larva for its babies. And yet in your yard, if you put in a lot of non-native trees, it's not going to find the food there it needs to feed its babies. It needs a good oak tree. And um, so a lot of yes, there's Every, every year you hear about this bird species not doing well and that bird species not doing well. This year, we haven't seen the bluebirds coming in because we had a horrible weather, horrible winter weather. Um, so there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, I'm just gonna say do more research, but I'm gonna let Diane talk a little bit. Well, I think you really, you that was really good what you said, Therese. That's just the most important thing. Uh, really, we'd like to be able to create habitat on a, on a regional level and on a world level that is my prayer, my hope um, that that happens. But in the meantime, since the world doesn't listen to me, my government doesn't listen to me, um, in my own, in my, on my own land, and I'm fortunate enough to have a few acres, I'm getting rid of those, na those non-native plants that do not produce food for birds, like honeysuckle, like the, the non-native Amur honeysuckle, and I'm planting native trees, shrubs, and flowers that do nurture the, our native insects, which is what those birds need to feed their babies. They can't, the babies can't live. If those chickadees can't find little caterpillars, people may think, oh, I don't want caterpillars. Yes, if you love birds, you want caterpillars. If you want caterpillars, then you need to plant the, the plants that are belong in this area because those are the plants that our butterflies and moths can lay their eggs on, just like the monarch butterfly has to have the, the, the milkweed. Every kind of butterfly and moth has certain plants that it needs. And if you have something that came from Japan, nothing that lives here is gonna be able to use that. And so that's an empty plate for the birds in your yard. So if you want birds, plant the food, plant the plants that will allow the birds to get the food they need. And I think and I we think need to educate ourselves a little bit about what is a weed and what is not a weed. Because a lot of times we think of, well, that's a weed and we take it out of my yard and you might find, no, it might be a weed agriculturally, but for like the monarch butterfly or for uh, the goldfinch or Eastern goldfinch. I mean, they love thistle and monarch and they're late nesters because they won't, they won't, uh, start building their nests and tell that, that uh, the seeds are maturing. Okay. There's the fluff to use for their nests. And they're an unusual bird. They feed their babies almost entirely seeds instead of a caterpillar. So just educate yourself about uh, what's native and what's not. That's really important. And, and, and the only thing I would add too is um, considering habitat and knowing that birds like messy yards. And so if you want to have a perfectly manicured lawn, um, that's going to be a lot less attractive to birds than um, a little bit of a pile of brush or a tree that fell down a long time ago and don't remove those kinds of things because the birds really um, have great, be there's great benefits for the birds in those. And so someone asked about woodpeckers on, on chat. Someone was interested in woodpeckers because they do come to the, to the hummingbird feeders and the oriole feeders. They'll eat the jelly. They'll, they'll, the downy woodpeckers are all over my hummingbird feeder sucking up the sugar water. I hope that's okay. <laughs> but they also need those trees with the holes in them. So if the tree has holes in it, and it's a rotten old tree. If it's going to fall on your house or your car, you've got to get rid of it. But if it's in your woods or someplace where it's not going to hurt anything, you leave that. That lets those, those woodpeckers uh, have a place to nest. And when they're done with it, the chickadees will take it the next year. Yep. Great. Thank you both. We're going to... Um have Sandra close us out here, and then we can all come back and ask more questions. Okay. This is a poem from Mary Oliver uh, called Gold Finches. Awesome. In the fields we let them have, in the fields we don't want yet, where thistles rise out of marshlands of spring. In spring, 
open each bud a settlement of riches, a coin of reddish fire. The finches wait for midsummer, for the long days, for the brass heat, for the seeds to begin to form when the harmony whistles, dazzling as the teeth of mice, but black, filling the face of every flower. Then they drop from the sky a buttery gold. They swing on the thistles. They gather a silvery down. They carry it in their finchy beaks to the edges of the field, to the trees, as though their minds were on fire with a flower of one perfect idea. And there they build their nests and lay their pale blue eggs every year. And every year, the hatchlings wake in the swaying branches in the silver baskets and love the world. Is it necessary to say any more? Have you heard them singing in the wind of the final fields? Have you ever been so happy in your life? Thank Lovely. you. Thank you, Donna. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming. Really, this was very, very fantastic, interesting. Um, our next Lunch and Learn series is June 8th. As you see, uh, speakers are Tony Langowski, uh, 2021 political science graduate from UWL. And he's going to speak on Echo Advocacy 101, Faith Groups in Action. Thanks again for so much of your attention. Cool. Thank you, Sandra. Thank we you. want to respect everyone's time, but if, if Therese and Diane want to field a few more questions, we, we can stay on for a couple minutes. Okay. I'm going to search the chat here real quick. So just, just a couple questions about, you know, saying something about the regular nut hatch and the rose-breasted nut hatch. Um, if you want to include that now, I don't know if you have it, we can make sure it's part of the recording and then, yeah, we're, okay. we're good. Meg, is it possible to bring up either of those pictures? Sure thing. Sure thing. It'll just take me a minute to get there. Okay. So while she's looking for it, we can guess that the, the either nuthatch is going to be upside down in the picture. <laughs> it's, not oh, because right. Meg, it's not because Meg doesn't know how to run her computer. It's <laughs> because nuthatches walk upside down. They walk down the, down the tree trunk. That's just the way they like to do it. And that way they can easily get the bugs and things that are hidden under the top edge of those little flakes of bark. And I think their counterpart is the brown creeper who goes, who walks up the trunk and he gets the ones, the bugs that are on the underside. Um, actually, have, this is actually a tweezer-like beak. That little beak is really fine pointed. They can get in there and, and like uh, Diane said, get those little insects, the eggs. And um, they also have one of their cool adaptations is on their back, on their feet, their back toe is enlarged and a little bit longer and it has a better hook on it. So, so it keeps them nice and uh, safe going down that tree. You want a good hook on your toe if you're gonna go down at first and, on a tree. And the, and the bill kind of tilts up a little bit, which is yeah. an, interesting, an interesting thing. If you do see one horizontal sometime, which does happen occasionally, it looks like it's you know kind of got a little stuck up. Its nose is sticking up a little bit. Yeah. Just, just the way that bird is shaped. And he goes, eh, 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 eh. I don't know, that's not very good. Does that sound like him, Therese? I, eh, thought, eh. I thought, my gosh, there's a nuthatch right here. That's a nut <laughs> um, they, um, they get their name nuthatch from the fact that they will uh, take a larger seed and they will uh, put it into a, a, a little notch somewhere and then they'll hatch. They'll hatch open that seed or the hack open that seed. And that's where they get their name from. You got the red, red uh, breasted there? Sure do. Oh, goody. There this one's go. even smaller than the white breasted nuthatch and has that dramatic black line, th line through his eye. This is actually the, e I believe this is the easiest bird in North America to hand tame. If they're hanging around your place in winter, which they sometimes do, and you're feeding birds in the winter, you put a few kernels of walnut meats on your hand and you don't really have to 
train them. You just can walk out and stand there next to your feeder. If you can stand the cold on your bare hand, one of these little guys will come and land on your hand and you'll feel this tiny, delicate little, little prickles of these tiny little feet that they'd be sharp, but they're so small and the bird is so light that it's just like, it's just like a, a divine little kiss when they land on you. It's absolutely wonderful experience. Here in Southern Iowa, this is, a, this is a really lovely occasional winter visitor. We don't get them every, every winter. You guys up in Northern uh, Wisconsin have them year round. Uh, this is one of the only birds that's ever, like Diane said, landed on my finger. Uh, I was just holding a container of peanuts and he came and landed on my finger and took a little peanut out of the peanut feeder and flew away. Um, they also have this really cool thing they do. Uh, when they make their nest, they, I've never seen it, of course, because they don't nest around here, is they take resin, you know, they take the sticky sap from pine trees, and they stick it around the hole into their house, and they, they, um, they say that the, they, it's supposed to be like maybe to protect them from predators or maybe competitors, they have that sticky stuff around the hole. Now, they avoid it by just flying straight in through the hole. Um, I know that I, <laughs> And, and my friend Meg knows I hate things that are sticky. So I would definitely not harass a red-breasted nuthatch if he did that around the hole of the tree. So they're cool birds. Very cool.